You're listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Parker Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Case, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Shubhada Kulkarni. Shubhada is APMP certified at the practitioner level and 2020 APMP's 40 Under 40 awardee. She has recently debuted at the APMP WBVE, sharing her experiences and learning about proposal management in IT industry. Currently, she's working as a proposal quality reviewer with Fujitsu Consulting India. She has over 14 years of experience into pre-sales and business development. Through her career span, she has served various roles such as project engineer, systems design engineer, technical writer, manual tester, and proposal manager. While working on her first proposal for an intelligent traffic management system, she caught the proposal bug and she never looked back. She's a budding grammar stickler in her current role, and she provides feedback on improving the compelling nature of proposals. Shibita holds a bachelor's degree in instrumentation and control from a university and a postgraduate diploma in operations management. Shubita has received appreciation for her creativity and commitment to the role at multiple instances. She has also received APMP's inaugural Charlie Devine Scholarship for certification in 2019. Shubita enjoys traveling, music, and photography. She's an avid reader and finds Haruki Mar- Marakami's storytelling quite interesting. She's also learning violin, wow, and recently picked up K-pop fever too. Welcome, Shubhada, to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Ashley. And it's a pleasure being uh, here on this talk and having a heart-to-heart conversation with the two of you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're so excited to have you with us and to learn just a little bit more about you. So to start off, can you tell us a little bit about where you were born, where you grew up, and where you went to school? Sure. So uh, I have mostly spent my childhood in and around Pune. I was born in a small town uh, about 100 uh, kilometers away from Pune. It's called Ahmednagar. It has its own historical uh, importance in the history of uh, India's uh, freedom movement. Uh, mm-hmm. I did my schooling in a town called Rajguru Nagar that is also close to uh, Pune. And it was named as such in the honor of one of Indian uh, freedom fighters, Shivram Rajguru, who was born here. So mm. you can imagine the patriotic influence I've had uh, since childhood. Mm-hmm. Also, um, in my uh, debut talk at uh, WBVE, I mentioned about Pune being the Oxford of the East. So uh, mm. I had access to most of the cultural events around dance, literature and technology that happened mm. in Pune as I grew up. So, yeah. Uh, after uh, schooling in Rajguru Nagar, I uh, shifted to Pune. Uh, it's mm-hmm. more of a city considering the other two towns I mentioned. Mm-hmm. And it has a lot of colleges and every course that uh, uh, any major uh, institutes offer across the globe. So I did my uh, engineering from Savitri Bhai Phule, uh, Pune University. And I graduated in 2004. So that's about my schooling. I have done my (laughs) postgraduate uh, diploma uh, uh, as a distance learning diploma, I would say, uh, Mm -hmm. while I was working with my first employer. Okay. Wow, that's so exciting. It's very cool to kind of grow up in such a cultural area um, that has so much historical influence. And I'm sure that's influenced um, you as an individual and kind of your upbringing as well. Yes. Um, so you had, you know, a very technical degree, it sounds like. So was your first job more in the technical field? Yes. So uh, before I got into my first job, I was, you know, I was jobless for almost 1.5 years after graduation. Oh. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I was doing small jobs here and there, like uh, taking tuitions for uh, primary school students or mm. Uh, you know, doing some uh, designs, henna designs for uh, family functions. And then I was also <laughs> a personal assistant to uh, one of the heads of department in my college that I graduated from. So that <laughs> those were the small jobs. But I landed in my first job that earned me uh, uh, 
a decent salary i would say uh, close to 1.5 years after graduation and mm-hmm. it was into uh, project engineering okay so i was a junior project engineer there and that was a intelligent traffic uh, management system uh, company so it took uh, undertook turnkey projects and uh, did installation and maintenance of those projects for highways and traffic management oh my goodness wow all of that is way above my head <laughs> so <laughs> In your intro, you, we said uh, you kind of worked on a proposal and then you caught the proposal bug and never went back. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Uh, so as I said, uh, I was working for this intelligent traffic management system company as a junior engineer. And after giving me some small assignments on the uh, you know implementation of the software and hardware, uh, we the company landed into an rfp or government tender for uh, <laughs> a new up, upcoming project and it looked like i was one of the available resources <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, to keep me busy i would say they asked me to work on this proposal and i was just fascinated about uh, you know um, being a part of a project already where i uh, helped the team in the implementation of the software and uh, hardware and then uh, writing uh, manuals installation manuals or uh, user manuals for those systems and then i was the tables turned i would say and i was in the pre sales uh, part of the uh, the contract where i was mm-hmm. writing about the government uh, giving us the work for future so i mm-hmm. found it fascinating about designing the uh, entire project and doing reading the uh, uh, you know the civil drawings uh, mm-hmm. you know, and all those things fascinated me uh, it it kind of gave me an idea of the of the bigger picture how the uh, the government wanted us to do installation of the software hardware and then uh, maintain the system for 5 years and what kind of slas we were going to have the penalties you know <laughs> or mm-hmm. credits if the project yeah. was successfully done and uh, running a proof of concept and those sort of things so uh, i i really enjoyed it and after that i was part of the project uh, even after you know we won the project and continued with the installation and uh, business as usual so mm-hmm. i sort of completed that entire cycle uh, yeah. and it was interesting oh that's so amazing so uh, infrequently those of us in the proposal world get to see a project from start to finish like that so i bet that was such an amazing experience particularly yeah. that being the first proposal that you worked on yeah <laughs> <laughs> Eighteen years. How has your uh, career evolved over those eighteen years? Yeah. Um, so uh, I was in my first job for almost four point five years. So I did mm-hmm. manage uh, a bit of pre-sales activity as well as installation and uh, post uh, uh, go live uh, opportunities. Mm-hmm. I was also mentoring the new joiners in the team uh, because you know it was a small organization. uh initially we had uh, close to 15 people <laughs> so you can actually say it was sort of a startup in india with its uh, headquarters in austria mm. and then uh, it grew to become a 150 people organization so we mm. had a lot of people joining this and uh, learning new things so i was sort of uh, helping them uh, get acquainted and mm-hmm. after that i uh, I took a break because it sort of became monotonous for me so i did a diploma in technical writing because i thought it was naturally a progression for me to go from proposal writing to writing installation manuals and user manuals i thought i would explore technical writing but i think uh, the pre sales bug was not uh, letting me <laughs> uh, so, so i joined another organization as a business development executive mainly mm-hmm. for proposal writing work and uh, after that uh, so uh, this was a switch from the intelligent traffic management uh, domain to it services domain and since then i have uh, switched three jobs 
I think my threshold with any organization is around 4.5 years. So mm-hmm. I keep pushing uh, just to get new challenges because after a, a certain point, I guess I get it gets monotonous, and I uh, uh, if I'm not doing something challenging and learning new skills, then I try to look for uh, another opportunity where I can prove my metal and you know learn something new. Yeah, absolutely. So that's how I landed in this job at uh, Fujitsu. And mm. I am enjoying the way uh, my career has progressed from being a, a proposal coordinator, technical writer, to being a business development executive, a proposal manager, and now into proposal quality reviews. I'm, I'm quite enjoying it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you've gotten to kind of experience all the different pieces of you know, the proposals, right? And so that's always an exciting kind of career progression to, yeah. to have. Uh, so before we um, dig into APMP and, you know, um, your career a little bit deeper, can you tell us three things that not many people know about you? Uh, okay, it's interesting because uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'm an introvert person, but to my close friends circle, uh, they know mm-hmm. everything about me. So uh, <laughs> that uh, I would like to share on this platform um, are like, I have two tattoos. One that's a silhouette of a violin and the other one is uh, hope as the word and mm. sort of, it, uh, they sort of keep reminding me the you know, uh, something that I look forward to or when I'm stressed, that there is mm-hmm. hope. <laughs> and yeah. um, music and violin is something that I, uh, you know, I love uh, uh, as a stress uh, release. I listen to mm-hmm. some uh, music and violin is something that's really close to my heart. I'm uh, learning it. It's so difficult, but I'm still trying my <laughs> so That's one thing. Uh, yeah. The other thing is I... Um, I have some weird, uh, you know, uh, a weird uh, fetish, I would say, about accessories. So I have a lot of uh, <laughs> accessories in terms of uh, shoes and sandals, uh, caps mm. or hats and then <laughs> goggles. So I have them at least and uh, wrist watches, of course. So I have them in double digits. I won't say the number so that Bhaskar <laughs> won't say. <laughs> um, yeah. And... Uh, the third thing, I think I mentioned it in our uh, fun event in WBVE, but uh, I would still mention that again. Uh, my experience of watching the uh, Northern Lights, uh, it, oh. it was amazing. Yeah. And yeah. it's an unforgettable memory. <laughs> I simply enjoyed the uh, entire experience and I would love to uh, watch it again. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I bet that was beautiful. That's definitely on my bucket list. (laughs) You must experience it. Uh, It's amazing. Yeah. The pictures are beautiful and I'm sure, you know, in person, it's even more amazing. (laughs) Um, So you talked about your first proposal that you worked on. Do you have any other proposal or capture efforts that are memorable and stand out to you? Uh, I have uh, a couple of them, but one that uh, stands out and, you know, uh, it's not something that uh, people <laughs> in the in the profile should follow. But, uh, you know, I was working on a strategic deal and we ended up spending more than 40 hours straight into the proposal. And it was one of the best proposals we had worked on. And no one really forced us to be in the war room for that long. But it was uh, such a strategic deal. And we were all so much into it that uh, we literally uh, were there in the war room and taking breaks only when necessary, you know. And it was uh, 40, 40 plus hours. Uh, I, so I went to office on Thursday and <laughs> returned only uh, after the submission on, uh, you know, Saturday morning or something like that but uh, yeah. it, it was exhausting but it was and not that I would like to repeat that experience but <laughs> <it's amazing. laughs> 
Uh, and then there have been instances where you know uh, we were so close to the uh, uh, finish line i would say you know the, the deadline to submit the proposal and mm-hmm. then i had to submit a hard copy and then i realized that i had uh, so during the paper binding i had flipped the papers so they were <laughs> they were uh, uh, bounded literally the other way around uh, just to, Yeah, uh, I think we've all done that with the hard copies. <laughs> I am so happy that we are submitting soft copies now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes yeah. that so much easier, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so we talked a little bit about APMP and your recent WBVE um talk. When did you yeah. join APMP as a member? yeah so i had heard of apmp i would say uh 10 years ago or so uh, but it was not officially launched in india and people still had to communicate with the uh, us uh, uh, you know the main organization and mm-hmm. the joining uh, membership fees were also high so mm-hmm. it was in my list but uh, i was not earning so much that i could spend uh, a significant amount on my membership but then mm-hmm. when uh, it was launched in india as an official chapter 3 years ago i think i was one of the first uh, few members uh, i mm-hmm. was actually excited that it's it's happening in it was happening in india yeah. and i was part of the uh, the first chapter that launched in my city pune and uh, yeah. i have been uh, actively participating in the conversations since then so yeah it it's great to be part of this community i have been uh, uh, you know participating in the webinars i have been going back to the bok every now and then and it's just amazing to see uh, you know uh, most of us are going through the same challenges and we are trying to get the smes and uh, the sales executive to follow the best practices or at least mm-hmm. give it as give us a chance to <laughs> implement them <laughs> yeah Oh yeah, that's amazing. So, um APMP in India is quite new. Um are you seeing an increase in awareness of APMP from the time you became a member? Yes, yes. Uh I had expected uh, to have chapters in the main cities, you know, the cities mm-hmm. uh, that are so called uh, IT cities in India, the tier 1 mm-hmm. IT city. but we have a lot of people from tier 2 cities as well and uh, mm-hmm. i have been getting uh, linkedin connection requests from all parts of india they are mm-hmm. asking me about uh, apmp certifications and uh, what sort of uh, vacancies are um, available in india so i see a lot of buzz around apmp the certifications and how the community is growing after attending the first event in mumbai this year in february i met so many people who are you know uh, i was surprised to see i think there were close to 200 people in that conference the first oh, wow. ever conference and uh, they were all upbeat and excited about uh, having uh, this conference so i hope the count grows i'm also trying to get uh, you know my uh, alumni college to get some student mm-hmm. courses um that are oh. relevant to APMP certification so i'm hoping that we will have a bigger community uh in the coming years oh yeah it sounds like you guys are doing some great things to try to you know improve awareness and improve membership and really kind of grow the profession there um do you have any ideas or suggestions to continue to improve that awareness yes uh we uh, i i am having uh, chats with the apmp uh, india governing uh, members uh, kk iyer mm-hmm. and sunil agarwal uh, i am actually trying to get uh, more students uh, mm. get students aware of you know there are uh, mm. roles in the pre sales uh, community because mostly in india or i think even abroad people are thinking about only software developer or tester Uh, roles and then they are going into management but even without doing uh, management or whatever is the graduation degree you hold you can still get into pre sales mm-hmm. because we don't have to have a uh, technical background you can learn everything 
you yeah. come up with a different perspective whatever is your graduation degree so i'm just uh, you know I, i want apmp india to concentrate on spreading awareness about uh, the entire pcs community and then mm-hmm. we can have more people participating in the discussions and companies floating more jobs about you know proposal writers and bid managers than just looking at us as uh, mere coordinators for the smes and sales mm-hmm. Uh yeah that that's amazing and you know starting with you know the younger students it's definitely you know so critical and you can see that effort you know globally with APMP yeah. so it's great you're kind of leading that charge You've been an avid contributor kind of in the community um so how was it sharing your experiences to Rikeris at WBBE I was so excited when I received uh, <laughs> you know I I had submitted my uh, synopsis for the uh, BPC in Europe uh, mm-hmm. I wanted to present in Europe and I received a, a communication saying my uh, my synopsis they found my synopsis interesting and mm-hmm. they had kept me in the waiting list in case uh, one of the main speakers had to drop off uh, mm-hmm. for some for any reason I uh, was like okay at least uh, my synopsis was interesting and probably in future I'll get a chance and mm. I never expected Rick to come back to me for WBVE and mm. uh, I did not want to present something that most of the uh, community members know about you know uh, mm-hmm. uh, about the best practices or the roles and how is it changing with covid and the technology and so on so I mm-hmm. actually wanted to keep it informal and um have some uh, understanding about how we operate from india and mm-hmm. the kind of uh, excitement uh, i had I-, i was so glad that it reciprocated with the audience and i have some amazing feedback from uh, those who attended the session during my slot uh, as well as those who watched it after my slot and it's just so um, motivating uh, I mean I can keep talking about my passion for proposal <laughs> management uh, but I was glad that I I could uh, you know communicate the message that I wanted to uh, to that uh, first uh, session. Oh yeah that's amazing and what a great experience uh, to be able to share that with so many people through WBBE the, so many attendees yeah, you know I, I such mean, a- Up to two thirty people had uh, <laughs> deserved a slot for my session. Yeah. I never expected that to happen. <laughs> It's amazing. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about your APMP certification journey and your advice you might have for others um, in India looking for certification? Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, you know as i mentioned in my wbbe talk as well uh, we in india have been following the best practices in silos uh, there was no place for us to go back to to see you know if this is something that everyone follows uh, or how, how can we have uh, the attributes that contribute to a good proposal what does a good proposal look like because everything we submit as an organization for any rfp is confidential and you cannot really share uh, mm-hmm. that information if you switch jobs so uh, apmp opened that uh, you know apmp bok gave us exposure to the best practices that most of us in the industry were following and mm-hmm. when i uh, joined fuditsu uh, you know fuditsu with it uh, with it Japanese heritage and being process oriented, we had mm-hmm. a lot of processes in place, and put it to UK and uh, APMP, uh, Shipley UK, mm-hmm. you know, have a long-standing relationship. So our processes were aligned to the practices that Shipley follow, and mm-hmm. then uh, it uh, sort of, you know, it was easier for me to uh, appear for the foundation certification. uh having the knowledge of the best practices tools and templates uh, that we have in put it uh and th- that is how i prepared myself for the foundation certification and then came the uh, charlie divine scholarship so i got my scholarship uh, you know i applied for it i think i was uh, one of the first few uh, uh 
applicants from india and uh, <laughs> i had a good uh, recommendation from uh, my mentor martin ekstein who was also you know uh, talking to the apmp india governing body members mm-hmm. and tony burch so i mm-hmm. think that got me the uh, you know uh, the recommendation really helped me in getting my tally divine scholarship so i completed my foundation certification and uh that really opened up uh, the uh, you know the the certification um, apmp certifications for my organization in india and uh, also to my linkedin networks so they mm. came to me asking about uh, why they should do the certification and how is it the validation of you know 10 plus years of their experience and why should they do it and we have had those sorts of uh, Uh, discussions and arguments if you will and it just increased the curiosity among people and i even t- till date i get uh, queries about whether the certification is going to help people mm. uh, in get, uh, landing a job offer or getting that promotion and i i would say you know i am uh, a true apnt volunteer as <laughs> i've made people take membership i think at least 10 plus people outside my organization to take membership <laughs> yeah and if if i can get uh, more students into the community that will be uh, you know that's my ultimate goal <laughs> Oh, wow. That's amazing. And yeah, definitely, you know, we need more of those students who want to join the profession and learn how to do it right from the beginning. Um, yeah. So love that. You are also a 40 under 40 award winner. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that award and kind of what that meant to you? Yes. Uh, so, I have been uh, working as a proposal uh, coordinator, proposal writer, and reviewer for 14 years now. And mm. you know, at times it was a thankless job. People just came to me for final formatting and editing. I gave them <laughs> suggestions about you know we are not complying to the bid submission requirement, so we are not answering the exam question. And uh, you know, if you give me time, I can help you in. in more ways than just formatting and editing uh so just uh, just involve me uh, early in the next bid so i was trying to get all uh, you know uh, uh, people on the same page for mm-hmm. uh, uh, having a proposal manager early uh, in the bid cycle and then uh, uh, this particular role in uh, fujitsu is uh, is a dedicated role for proposal management it mm. doesn't uh, have bid management of so the a bid manager doesn't have additional responsibility of proposal management these mm. are two separate roles here so uh, you know i could do so much more than simply formatting and editing you mm-hmm. know exploring storyboarding having compelling executive summaries or quantifying the quality of uh, proposals and helping teams in getting compelling uh, proposals out of the door uh, yeah. you know trying to educate the smes about uh, uh, what a good proposal looks like so mm-hmm. I, i was uh, i thought i made some contribution there and that's how i applied for my uh, apnp 40 under 40 award uh, yeah. and uh, i mean we had 90 plus uh, uh, applicants this time and mm. being selected as one of the 40 people it's amazing and yeah. i think it has given more uh, you know uh, uh, it's a validation sort of uh, from the industry that this is an important role and uh, it sort of gave some inspiration to my team members as well because i have a full fledged team of uh, 10 plus proposal managers in fujitsu mm. and a lot of uh, other uh, connections on linkedin or from my previous employment so uh, yeah. it, i think i whatever i did was not just for myself it was for you know the small circle of proposal management professionals that i have uh, yeah. it, it's great uh, i am honored to have this uh, award uh, you know uh, it, it's great simply 
Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like you've been able to kind of help inspire those around you to continue to kind of build their skill sets and achieve, you know, similar things that you've achieved. So that's so great. Um, I think this is an amazing kind of transition into our more lighthearted round, our netters round. Uh, so Basker is going to take over some questions from here. <laughs> Thank you, Shubhada. Shubhada, three things that caught my attention. It's not just about proposal best practice or anything to do with APMP. Number one, tattoos. Number two, violin. <laughs> Number three, <laughs> accessories. You know, it's, it's fascinating. So uh, tattoo, so the perception of somebody having a tattoo, you know, we have, we, people see them differently, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the second one is violin, which is completely opposite, classical, which is like, oh, so nice, godly. And third you have, uh, which is being normal, which is accessories or how many handbags. Are. Of course, I do have, I'm going to ask you a question. How many handbags do you have and other things? <laughs> Yeah. How do you cope or you know, that seems like you have this multifaceted personality. Um, yeah, how do you balance that? I, I actually, um, you know, I don't try to restrict myself in, uh, although I said I am an introvert person, mm. but I don't try to restrict myself in the typical uh, Indian girl sort of, you know, mold. I have been doing things that uh, my mother uh, actually get worried about, like having tattoos and my friends never expected me to have tattoos. Uh, uh, but it is something that I uh, find exciting and assuring. Uh, I have been doing things that are not <laughs> normal. I don't fit in any mood. Mm -hmm. I'm not someone who follows any herd either. So... I am, I'm a loner, I would say, but uh, I have a good uh, friend circle to keep me sane. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, sure. but I think to be honest, tattoos are very common and, and it was part of a gender practice until 1900s, 1940s. My grandma, my great grandma, they all had tattoos, my granddad, my great granddad. Yeah. And, and it's normal practice. We just write our name there. We, we just do a few bits around yes. it. And for you some, know what, I'll tell you a childhood story. So uh, I have one elder sister and a younger brother. So I'm the second girl child and my maternal uh, granny was a little worried about, you know, is my daughter going to have all daughters and then it will be difficult for her to be in the society. So when my brother was born, she actually wanted me to tattoo my brother's name on my hand. Mm -hmm. And we went to the tattoo artist and the moment they started the needle, I literally ran from that place. <laughs> so I have just one <laughs> mark on my hand uh, from that old tattoo. But then these two designs are uh, uh, something that uh, that are very close to my heart. And uh, these are not original designs. These are not my designs, but I'm so grateful to the artist who shared it on Google. <laughs> so... Yeah, they have some meaning for me. They might not uh, sound much meaningful to others, but uh, they are for me and not for others. Got you. That's that's very very interesting. I think that, as you mentioned, there is a long-standing uh, you know tradition for us to do this. Um, maybe these days perception is different, but I'm glad that the culture is coming back where you know that people are doing that. And and it also you know for some reason people also say it's also good for health to a certain extent. You know something like that but anyway uh, that's a master class on tattoos violin when did, <laughs> when did you start violin i uh, so uh, music has been into my family i would say i have uh, a lot of cousins who are into singing and uh, some of my uh, cousins play instruments like guitar and tabla or harmonium uh, my father uh, loved music and uh, you know, uh, we always used to have radio on since 5.30 in the morning to 11.30 and when the, the local radio station would go off. Uh, so I was always listening to music, but I think violin is something that uh, I feel it resonates well with the human emotions. Mm. So, you know, the C chord takes you, uh, I, love, I think that the C chord is uh, more when you're little depressed and sad and uh, it's similar to your emotions when you're feeling stressed and E is very energetic you know E, F, 
is very energetic when you are happy or the music that violin plays when uh, they are playing in e chord is very happy and energetic so i found that it is very close to the human emotions and for some reason that has stayed with me for a long time uh, i started learning violin only 3 4 years ago i have a violin of my own uh, and it's so difficult for me to pick it up now because my hands won't move you know and i have very short <laughs> hands so uh, i am trying my best um, i think it will take my lifetime to <laughs> get first song out of it but um, i i think i i am more proud that i have uh, it in my possession more than anything and i keep listening to music so it could be a violin instrumental uh, it just calms me down a lot Hundred, hundred percent, hundred percent sure. You are totally blessed uh, to play violin because violin is one instrument that can, as you rightly said, can swings people's emotions within short span yeah. of seconds. And I cried big time when I hear violin for some reason. <laughs> so <laughs> same, same here. Like yeah. uh, there are some songs in Bollywood and Marathi, the regional language, you know. Uh, and the the moment the violin starts in those songs, it. it can uh, it transport you into a completely different world and i think that's what fascinates me about violin 100% 100% so i do i do uh, you know the the place where i came to uk as a student is called international students house there i think uh, around 12 to 15 students out of 40 they tend to come from music schools um oh. so we always see them play you know from piano to some are singers you know some play violin as right is said trumpet trombone um so for 6 7 years you know after my studies i was there warden and now i'm a trustee of the place so every year i go to concerts that's run by here royal wow. college royal college of music so it kind of changed the entire perspective of our music um is part of me you know before uh, it was different now it's more classical but yeah violin 100% so keep keep continuing practice it as hard as you can so sure. let's officially enter uh maybe one more question before we officially enter the nutters round haruki murakami that's a tough read uh, <laughs> how did he code into haruki murakami i uh, you know uh, i have been blessed to have uh, family members who are into different things and uh, friends who are into uh, you know different genres when it comes to hobbies and this uh, Uh, she is my best friend she is into writing uh, and reading and writing and she doesn't follow any genre particularly so she was just reading kafka on the shore by haruki murakami and i was just reading the first chapter and it got me uh, fascinated with the uh, style of writing and the messages that it had I, I, it's amazing uh, I, and once i start reading a book i usually don't uh, you know close it unless i completely read it uh, that sort of mad fascination about uh, reading i have i picked it up from my father i think yeah so uh, I-, i am fascinated by uh, murakami and i keep reading anything and everything that i found uh, find interesting so uh, murakami has been consistent i would say from the uh, international uh, arena and then some uh, regional authors um, Uh, yeah so uh, it's interesting because being uh, you know uh, being able to read and uh, write in uh, english uh, and uh, a lot of regional language languages as well uh, it gives me exposure to a lot of uh, different diverse uh, writing styles and uh, it just gets interesting the more you read it the more you find it interesting so true so true. i think some of our guests are very avid readers and sometimes i am in awe with them my god i i i am into audio books because i'm lazy and i don't carry books with me um so but i'm into of, hard bound you know ah, pages i love this mail actually <laughs> exactly. some of our listeners like you know john williams and the others and they read classics like in and out like three or four in a week yeah. sometimes and i'm like <laughs> wow <laughs> get there but yes k pop Um, oh yeah, <laughs> like, uh, K-pop is very unique. Normally, you know, I I got into pop only I came to UK. That's how bad I was with the Western music. But K-pop is uh, when did that happen? 
I am, as I said, I am into music uh, for a long time. I did listen to, uh, you know, American uh, pop songs, I would say, and also instrumental, instrumental. So I have some Yanni piano recordings and nobody expected me to have them. And then some regional uh, classical music. But K-pop was something I literally accidentally got into. Uh, because of the K dramas, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I, I just find it fascinating. They are uh, they the uh, the entertainment companies catch them young and they groom them so well. And these kids have so so much talent. And I am I'm mean, into BTS. Uh, I'm sure you must have heard of them. They write such beautiful songs. They are uh, such great characters, you know. And uh, they they enjoy what they are doing and so jealous of them because as a kid, I was into singing and dancing and drama and everything except for sports. <laughs> and I actually wanted to be an artist myself as a kid. Uh, and uh, to see people, you know, doing what they like and being so great at it. And they are able to move the audiences across the globe at uh, such a young age. Uh, it's amazing and i just got me hooked to k-pop and uh, uh, to know that so there are so many people in india who who are following k-pop it's not just you know the uh, usually the northeastern uh, states in india you know the seven sisters uh, usually people say that they are more inclined towards japanese and korean culture but it's also there down south or anywhere uh, up north or in uh, Maharashtra for that matter. So it's amazing the kind of audience we have in India. 100%. I think there is a lot of uh, correlation or kind of culture. They are very similar as well, Korea and India. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, food, we share uh, our Independence Day. <laughs> what more do you want? <laughs> exactly. So it's, and, uh, and again, you know, with, with me, you being Murakami fan, even J pop, K pop, it's very similar. You're right how they nurture it. But but also having having been in Japan and having married to a Japanese wife, you know, it's like sometimes it's a bit too much for them. They are kind of molded too much around the music there. So their whole yeah. life outside music is different. So, you know, I don't know. It's a mixed feeling for me over there. But definitely the music, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very, very, very interesting on that one. So, yes, let's... Uh, now, for the third time, let's officially enter the Nutters round. So, are you a morning... <laughs> Or a random, uh, or your morning or a night person? Um, I would say morning person. Oh nice. How lucky are you and why? I am so lucky. Um, I mean, uh, you know, uh, when I was born, I had some infections and I had some infections over my uh, head, you know, and uh, my mom um, delivered me in a civil hospital. And my father was still uh, traveling from his, uh, you know, the deputation he was in. So uh, both my mom and I were close to, you know, uh, you know, counting our last moments. And then I cried and uh, the nurse attended by mom. So And then I have been, uh, I was not a a very healthy child. You know, I had migraine uh, from a very young age and still have migraine. So no one expected me to be healthy over the period of time. You know, no, not to say that, you know, uh, they never expected me to be an engineer uh, and then be uh, uh, financially independent, so to say. So whatever I have achieved so far and the kind of friend circle I have, I think I've, I'm lucky. Uh, I, I, I am most lucky, I would say, at this point of time in my life. Perfect, hundred percent, hundred percent, sure that you are. So, do you have a nickname? Um, I I do, but I'm not sure if would it would make any sense. Uh, it is uh, related to my sister's name. <laughs> so, um, uh, and also uh, my initials. So, my name is Shubhada Ramchandra Kulkarni. That comes out to S R K. And you might be knowing SRK is a big Hollywood uh, mega star, you know, Shah Rukh Khan. So that's one of my nicknames. 
Hundred percent. You are the Shah Rukh Khan of the proposal world. Uh, <laughs> I am not a Shah Rukh Khan fan actually, but uh, my friends just love to tease me with that nickname. <laughs> so, if you could eat only three foods for the rest of your life, what would you choose? Three foods. Uh, it has to be dal chawal. <laughs> you know the rice and curry, Indian rice and curry. and uh, uh, one of the sweets uh, regional sweets puran poli right. yeah <laughs> one more i am not a big foodie i am a typical uh, i come from a typical maharashtrian uh, brahmin family so <laughs> that's why my cho- choices are very uh, limited and my palate is not as developed as i would like it to be <laughs> Don't worry, I will take you out for a spin. Food is everything for me. So whether I have food is <laughs> for me, so that's great. So, uh, what is that one childhood fear you have not told anyone yet? Um, I am not sure. Um, I think uh, I have this fear, but uh, it's quite obvious. I have a fear of falling down and getting into an accident. Mm-hmm. And you know, I have been into accidents quite a few times. So uh, it's something that uh, I fear a lot about, and it has uh, affected my uh, you know leisure activities. So I'm scared of trekking, but I still go on treks. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's it. uh it's a fear that i think my family and friends know but i did not go on telling them that i'm scared and scared of it perfect so what was the last gift you gave someone um so uh i gave this uh, uh you know a set of uh, jigsaw puzzles to one of my friends kid uh, about uh, the Uh, seven wonders of the world and it comes with a 3d set of the seven wonders so he absolutely loved it <laughs> and i was so glad that uh, i could give him something that would uh, help him develop uh, some curiosity av- around the seven wonders of the world so yeah can you name the seven wonders of the world uh, <laughs> okay um the pyramids uh, taj mahal uh-huh opera uh, house in australia i'm not sure if that's what it is called uh the uh the the, uh, the leaning leaning tower pizza and uh, china wall yeah the <laughs> china wall i don't know how much is it <laughs> yeah you got you got, I, yeah you got 4 out of 7 and then we leave the rest to the listeners uh yeah <laughs> Let's do that. For them to do that, that's brilliant. And uh, have you ever sent a text message to a wrong person? Oh yes, yes. Um, and it was a like a it was a message that I wanted to send the uh, send to a friend of mine uh, about how uh, how I loved Kishore Kumar song, mm-hmm. you know, uh, one of the famous Bollywood <laughs> singers, and it he was a. he was a great uh, artist i would say and i by mistake sent it to my reporting manager during the work hours and i cannot imagine <laughs> how did i <laughs> do that but it was embarrassing to say the least and she responded i too like his songs or <laughs> what was that so no, uh, no luckily uh, my manager never got back but it was oh my god it was embarrassing <laughs> Uh, that we have, we have all have done that so many times don't worry about it <laughs> so what's the last thing you watched on tv and why did you choose to watch it ah uh, okay i watched uh, avengers infinity war uh, the sunday i think i i am into uh, avengers you know <laughs> uh, somehow i i i just love uh, following the entire franchise um and uh, i love the idea of, of having an iron man and then captain marvel and then hulk hulk is something that i relate myself to so much because i'm always angry really <laughs> no i'm just kidding 
Right. That's interesting. I think the image of Shubhada being Hulk is something I leave it to the listeners as well. <laughs> you can see the green Shubhada. That's great. Okay. How many accessories do you have, Shubhada? I would say types four to five. <laughs> And uh, uh, the footwear collection goes to 50 plus. And I have close to 12 wrist watches and let me not count the other accessories I have <laughs> but I love to color coordinate my uh, accessories with my attire um whenever I feel uh, doing so so yes I think and if you listen to Roshini and I do a uh, guest from uh, I know right she has 500 pairs and I could never beat her and my mom would probably faint if I <laughs> keep on buying 500 uh, pairs of footwear but I envy her I'm so jealous <laughs> there's something to work work to words to that's great so uh, okay so who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career um So in a personal life, I would say my parents and uh, my grandfather from my maternal side, uh, my uncle and uncles and aunties have been uh, have left a positive uh, influence. You know that they introduced me to reading, they introduced me to music. Uh, my uncles and my uh, aunt from maternal side uh, were teachers. Uh, they have retired recently. so you know uh, the way they taught to students and the discussions they would have uh, on the dining table was something i, I found really interesting um uh, and uh, of course my mom uh, you know my father was in india post and uh, he used to get transferred to a a uh, new location every few years so my parents decided that it it is best for us all three siblings to be at one place and my father would do all the traveling whenever it required so my mom sort of single handedly raised all three of us and my uh, father was detected with lung cancer and uh, he fought for 8 months and uh, he lost the battle so after that she has been you know uh, one of the main force so uh, on personal front yeah these are the people uh, also my teachers from my school and colleges i mean uh, i um, although i have been uh, schooling into a small town for you know the, until the 10th standard but the teachers i have had uh, were amazing they were well read they were uh, ready to experiment with uh, different styles for different students you know um, some some of us needed uh, micromanaging some of us uh were given a free um, you know a uh, free hold so to say uh, and we were allowed to read whatever we would like we were introduced to different uh, topics and we they were quite open to discussions and uh, they used to listen to our ideas so you know uh, that sort of uh, helped me build the confidence um and you know speaking publicly Mm. Uh, they also encouraged me in taking parts in various cultural activities and that's why uh, you know i could continue my journey in music uh, in whatever small way i could until uh, i you know went to the college mm. and professionally uh, i have had some amazing mentors right from my first job uh, and of course my uh, college uh, project guide uh, professor khole and uh, uh mr rangan rangarajan from my first uh, uh employment assignment and then uh, while working with tech mahindra uh, you know i have had uh, some of the best uh, people in the industry uh, and they were so humble i mean you you would learn so much just by being in their company so i would love to mention ts narayanan who is now the cto of colt in uk and uh aditya yagari or uh, uh, kanchan uh, uh, she she is a you know a lovely lady and so so much uh, technically uh, an expert and such down to earth people uh, i i wish i could be as humble as they are you know <laughs> down the line so 
um, a lot of people and then uh, some of the uh, friends I have made uh, throughout these these 14 years, you know, uh, people come from different backgrounds into the IT industry and uh, the way they develop themselves in the, the co due course of time, they have all been my motivation. Wow, no wonder you mentioned that you are lucky to whether you are. <laughs> yeah. So, but we are in COVID times, um, you know, things are very different to what we saw last year. Um, so, what have you observed lately that reminded you that people are kind? Um, you know, uh, from the last year to this year, uh, I would, uh, I would say whatever I saw on the television about how people are you know, helping each other in these difficult times, it just... Uh, gives me an assurance that there are still good people you know there are people who are willing to help uh, unconditionally uh, they are not looking for anything in return when they help you and uh, you know there are people from uh, uh, military or paramedics or uh, you know reserved forces who it's of course uh, part of their job but they are putting their lives at risk there are uh, housekeeping staff in uh, our companies or the uh, the household help that we have you know uh, of course it they have to do it because that's their only source of earning money but they are putting their lives at risk and they are doing it uh, you know they are not uh, they are not in uh, distress so to say they are doing it willingly and they uh, it's a calculated risk for them and still they are doing it. So I find it uh, reassuring that there are still good people in the world. 100%, Shubhada, 100%. So uh, who's the kindest person you know? Oh, I have so many kind people in my life. Uh, all my friends. Uh, you know, as I, as I told you, um, you know, I, I lost my father quite early uh, uh, I was 19 when we lost him and the financial situation was not uh, on our side. So I have a lot of friends who have helped me in whatever way they could, you know, in my studies or, you know, enjoying life as a college student or a teenager. I have had some uh, uh, mentors who helped me in uh, developing my skills and uh, giving me back the confidence too. So many people who have been kind to me. Uh, now, when I have done, you know, started doing some traveling as my personal interest, I have met so many people uh, who have traveled the world, who have worked for most part of their life, but they have been so open in, you know, uh, the conversations they would have with people half their age and. They would share their life experiences and it's amazing how you know uh, they are willing to help you or share their experiences and learnings and uh, want to listen to you even though you are you know they might know more than you uh, in terms of life and technologically they might be a little uh, it might be a little challenging for them but they are uh, open to discussions. So, what's one trait you like the most about yourself? Um, as, as cocky or cliche it might sound, but uh, you know, I am, uh, I am not afraid to voice my opinion. I don't like to mince my words, um, whether I'm talking to my parents or elderly people or on the personal front, or you know, uh, to some of uh, the SMEs or senior management uh, uh, if I'm, I'm working in a war room with them on a bit I have uh, probably I will uh, I'll choose my words um, uh, when I'm, I'm speaking you know uh, with senior people in professional uh, area but uh, I, I still would voice my opinion and uh, you know being in pre-sales and early on in a a turnkey project sort of uh, company. I used to be uh, either the only uh, female in the war room or project 
and people used to not listen to my voice as as much as i would like uh, like them to be uh, to but uh, over the years i have learned uh, how to put across my point uh, i i keep reading a lot so i have you know <laughs> opinions about different things and i can contribute to a discussion and i make sure that i put my point across there's nothing cocky there shubhada you are absolute star i mean <laughs> i wish i had this courage when i was very young i have to be very honest because i there were meetings rooms where i used to sit down because culturally in india you you tend to accept whatever your senior yeah. right so when i moved to uk for the first year or two even though i was encouraged to speak because it's very very open company that i got a work for circo that's my alma mater but i wasn't prepared to open up but gradually you know when i open up i realized why i didn't do that very young you just reminded me of that but brilliant you know please continue to be open honest and uh, straight 100% yeah. so um so what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career um you know these days i am quite surprised that people have a plan for themselves when they are studying you know uh, mm-hmm. my nephews and nieces who are uh, doing their uh, higher secondary uh, you know courses they know what they want to be in future they want to be uh, an engineer or a chef they know it even before uh, they uh, start with their graduation courses i wish i had a little idea about what i wanted to do uh mm. not that i'm complaining i don't have a plan even now and i'm happy with it but uh, i think i would have had more uh appropriate skills to the work that i am doing and uh, i would have read more relevant to the skills or the job that i wanted to do uh, probably i would have been uh, ahead in my uh, career uh in that sense otherwise i'm happy where i am right now i'm learning uh, one, at least one new thing every day and it's more than enough as of now so what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours uh you know i i would go back to uh you know uh the trait that i like about myself you know voicing your opinion mm. uh, that is something people are still not used to do mm. so uh, cool. yeah so voice your opinion and uh, don't uh, don't be scared to say no uh, i think culturally uh, or uh, I, i don't know whatever uh, the influence we might have we are too scared to say no to a customer who might be wrong mm. to a boss who might be wrong and who might be pressurizing you to work in a certain way and you might know what works well for you you know so give a valid argument don't just accept things because uh, someone else is telling you don't let that curiosity uh, die as you grow up <laughs> let that child be there in you. Uh, that's amazing uh, shubhada and I'm, i'm super happy to have you as my first female guest from india as <laughs> uh, i think it's uh, you have definitely set the standard for whoever is going to come next so the last one shubhada is you know you are where you are as you rightly said uh, based on the choices that you made super fulfilled career so far what's next for you shubhada um you know i uh, we have had this conversation baskar where you talked about giving back to the society and how education is very important to you and i have been talking to uh, one of my best friends about how you know we both come from uh, a small town she is my uh, schoolmate and we know each other for 30 years mm-hmm. and we have faced the challenges of coming from a small town uh, from a vernacular you know uh being from a marathi medium uh into uh, a city where uh, people have convent schools and all uh, uh people or my peers did give me a tough time in college uh and uh, in my first job so to say i i am also not a management uh, graduate so being in pre sales and not having the management degree uh, i had to work hard Uh, to make people uh, you know listen to me 
and mm. uh, follow whatever uh, information that i was sharing so it uh, then you know being uh, uh, in a company that uh, operates internationally uh, i have faced racism first hand uh, you know uh, people don't tend to uh, give us you know equal importance if not more uh, they still treat us as offshore resources and uh, we they treat us as uh, cheap resources that might not deliver the quality uh, the you know they expect so uh, having experienced all of this first hand and yet being here uh, at a position where i'm you know uh, you are conducting uh, uh, this talk with me i think i have something that i can help uh, the students from rural areas with uh, about how they can speak uh, on a public platform and it doesn't matter if you are speaking with the right grammar or not what matters is are you able to put forth your point you know uh, are uh, in a manner that people will listen to you do you have the confidence to speak up for yourself and your community so uh, me and this friend of mine we are uh, we want to start this uh, grooming session for uh, kids in rural areas especially uh, so uh, my friends uh, parents were teachers so they have these connections with the schools in uh, rural uh, uh, rural parts of uh, maharashtra state so i really want to do something there and uh, of course as i mentioned you know i want more students to be aware of the peacehills community and the jobs that uh, we have to offer so i think uh, I'm, i i will go back to teaching <laughs> and mentoring people uh, Yes, sure. But I think that's very, very powerful end to this episode because you are hundred percent right. I think you know. I was uh, my father was the first uh, kind of uh, school pass out from his village, and I was the first one to leave my village to come to do bachelor's degree. Um, learning from your own mother tongue, which tend to be ridiculed when you go to graduate college, where I wasn't even able to introduce myself uh, to all the way to here. It's a journey for everybody, and. Yeah. Uh, Looking back, you know, I am super confident. You know, with with the way you spoke, and I'm sure listeners will be as well. Um, you know, that giving back part, especially on the education side, you should definitely do uh, because there will be people who will be telling others you are not good enough. There will be a lot more people. Yeah. <laughs> But, But uh, it, yeah. I have I have uh, you know developed myself not to listen to them because their perception doesn't matter. Uh, it, it makes me happy. Uh, and i can genuinely uh, find uh, you know myself giving back to the society i think i'll follow it uh, whatever people say it doesn't matter super point that you brought you know one point that my coach always told me was which ingrained in me is your perception of me is a reflection on you and my response to you will be based on awareness on me so you know what that's my mantra in life so you know just to keep it going and thank you so much for joining scribble talk uh, shubhada it's been an absolute privilege to have you as a first female guest we had sunil just a week ago he was the first guest from india uh, but we we have you now so it's an absolute privilege wish you all the good health and happiness continue to inspire everybody around you please do focus on the education and mentoring as you focusing on next time when i speak to her there should be some progress there and uh, continue to inspire everybody around you stay safe stay healthy stay kind chubada thank you so much thank you vaskar thank you ashley it was wonderful talking to you thank you for your time take care bye bye it's for our listeners thank you so much for tuning in please visit batchesgribble.com/podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes if you've enjoyed today's interview Don't forget to subscribe, review and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Pascal Sundram. Signing off.